Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of our monthly Smart Sandyford series. Uh, through today's talk, we'll explore smart mobility, the future of transport. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Ivana Disparage from Trinity College Dublin and Matt McCann from Access Earth. You're both very welcome, guys. Um, so the overarching theme of this series is to look at smart, science, smart city topics and explore how the use of technology-based solutions can enhance the lives of residents and employees in Sandyford and indeed the wider Dublin region. Uh, this is an interactive session, so please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen uh, to ask panelists any questions through the talk. Uh, thank you to those of you who actually already sent questions in to me, uh, and we'll make sure to get through to those uh, today. So without further ado, uh, Ivan, I'll turn to you first. Uh, Ivan is a computer scientist. Over the last 10 years, she has taught in both UCD and TCD. She is now the Usher Assistant Professor in Future Cities and the Internet of Things in Trinity College Dublin. Her research uh, is, is based on um, the, the use of artificial intelligence or AI, including machine learning and the intelligent use of multi-agent systems to achieve autonomous optimization of infrastructure systems. It's quite a mouthful. Um, Ivana has a particular focus on smart city applications and sustainable urban mobility. So maybe Ivana, if you could tell us a little bit more about your research and what you're working on at the moment. Uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> and hi, Matt, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I have just one slide here briefly on my background. Basically, just to say that every answer that I have today for the questions that, that you might have or everything that I talk about today will come through the prism of computer science and particular artificial intelligence. So I'm a primarily computer scientist. Over the years, that interest has developed into using computer science and particular artificial intelligence for sustainability. A large chunk of that is sustainable transport, but I did some work on sustainable energy as well. Now, uh, gone are the days when computer scientists worked in isolation and did only computer science. So um, as you can see, I was involved in a number of both Irish and European projects that have been looking at sustainable mobility, some from pure computer science perspectives, for example, the um, urban traffic control was pure computer science project, but everything from, from that point on had different multidisciplinary dimensions. Uh, impact of autonomous cars on cities and urban design that was done with urban geography, uh, European network where we have everything from social scientists, economists, legal representatives, and so on, and uh, the work with, with uh, local authorities and governing bodies still to work with ITS Ireland, RSA and Transport Structure Ireland on uh, local impact on congestion and safety. So that is briefly my background and where most of my answers will, will come from. Yeah, I know we have a lot of people who are particularly interested in the uh, autonomous cars piece as well. So that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Matt, I'll turn to you now. So Matt McCann is the, the CEO of Access Earth and our second computer scientist today. Uh, almost five years ago, Matt founded Access Earth, which is an application that acts like a trip advisor for people with disabilities. Um, so you can go on and, and see how, uh, what, what services are available in local restaurants, shops or, or attractions. And so by providing this information, people are being given the opportunity to go out and experience new things that they wouldn't have been able to do before. Uh, Access Earth has recently been working on a project with ourselves in Smart Sandyford using European Space Agency satellites to map the district for the availability of accessible parking. So we're really excited to get, get to work with Matt and the gang uh, to, to get this report out. Um, and I, you know, we're gonna be discussing the findings of the study today, but that report will be available in its you know, we have a draft ready, but the final report will be out in the coming weeks, which is which is fantastic to see. Uh, so Matt, thanks a million for joining us today. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Access Earth and maybe the highlights of the, the Sandyford analysis? Yeah, uh, thanks me and Connor for, for giving us the opportunity to kind of work with you and doing this report to begin with. Um, but yeah, you, you basically gave us a better pitch than I usually do on these things and what we provide. So. Um, yeah, as a bit of a background, we, we have a consumer facing app that uh, allows people to sort of answer a set of yes or no questions on places like hotels, restaurants, coffee shops, that sort of thing. 
But as you mentioned as well, we're starting to bring in AI and machine learning to this because accessibility information does not just exist in one place, it's sort of all around us. And um, getting the opportunity to work with the ESA around, particularly on using satellite imagery to look at where accessible parking bays are within a community has been sort of really interesting for us. And um, I said kind of, you know, Smart Sandy Heard has sort of been the first sort of pilot area that we've been able to sort of test this. Um, and sort of in broad strokes, kind of what we had done is um, there's sort of two sections in that we've been able to, had to initially train our model on a series of what does accessible parking look like. Um, we did that through a series of time-lapsed um, satellite imagery uh, of different areas that weren't Smart Sandy for, because when you're training a model, you can't um, tell it what to look for before you even, it, it's essentially cheating. You're not, it's like you're teaching it how to talk essentially. And you can't tell it, if you're going to give it a test, you can't show it the answers beforehand. So um, what we've done was after training it over a series of iterations, this is sort of a kind of a laborious process, sort of labeling where on the image to look for this wheelchair symbol. Um, we then were able to go into the object detection phase where we had basically divided Smart Sandy for it out into I think it was about 1600 um, different pictures. So it means that we're intimately familiar with Sandyford's car parks, which is something I thought I would never say. <laughs> um, and this meant that with this grid, we fed that into the, into the classifier to see if there were places that would pop up. Now, a lot of the times it would be, say, green fields. So, logically, nothing came up in that sense. Mm -hmm. But um, when there were parking spaces that popped up, we were able to say, well, what type is it? Is it the hatch marking or is it the space? And what we were able to come to the conclusion was that there were effectively um, 175 in total. We were able to see about 114 that were above ground. Um, Connor, you'd help us get the underground ones because obviously satellites can't see underground yet. Um, and it meant that um, we were able to kind of do an analysis on just how many different types and the lack of kind of a stand or standard format there is uh, among these parking spaces, where, for example, only six were blue with hatch markings but also um, to see about from a council policy, there's meant to be 4% on accessible parking bays within a, um, a car park. And very few of them actually hit that standard. So while it's great that we've been able to paint this picture, um, what the current state looks like, it just gives us a good platform of how to make improvements going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think certainly, you know, before we started the project, I wouldn't have been aware of the issue as, as being as important as it is. And even as we were, we were going through this, I think it was in January, Irish Times came out with an article and said that uh, Ireland was the worst country in, in the European Union for accessibility parking. So certainly it's great to see new uh, projects like this, companies like yourselves working on these and trying to improve Ireland in this regard. Uh, but maybe Ivana, you know, we're, we high level stuff, we're talking about what is smart mobility. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit of what you understand that to be and, and what we should be aiming for both in, in Dublin and Ireland generally. Um, well, okay, I'll start with a computer science answer to what smart mobility is and of course then, then expand what is smart mobility should be from, from um, you know, overall society perspective. Uh, in terms of what we consider intelligent approaches or smart approaches to mobility problems that, that we encounter is perfectly matching demand and supply to utilize resources that we have as much as we can by either increasing demand, decreasing demand or increasing the supply. So that is where, where algorithms come in. We learn the patterns of demand, we learn patterns of supply, and we optimize the usage of resources. So what does that mean is that if we have given amount of road space, we redistribute the traffic in such a way or schedule the traffic lights in such a way that there's no, that we're not in a situation, there's congestion in one part and empty roads on the other. In terms of uh, let's say ride sharing or car sharing, which is which is the the work that I that I also do algorithms for for matching those. It means that there's no empty vehicles driving around while the, while there are passengers waiting somewhere. So we 
aim to rebalance the position of vehicles around the city to the places where, where there is event. That's from a technological point of view, but from the smart mobility from societal point of view, I think it really means meeting the mobility needs of everyone who wants to and needs to move around to wherever and whenever they need to move around. So it's not about one particular technology, it's about serving the people. Whatever modes, whatever algorithms does it take, it's about meeting the, the needs of people who need to move around. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of this multimodal approach, basically. Um, yes, so it's not one particular technology. It is a mix of technologies, of modes, uh, distribution around urban, suburban, rural types of, types of modes and so on. Fantastic, absolutely, yeah. Um, and Matt, maybe a little bit more on the accessibility side. What, what do you think the main challenges we face? You know, we talk about multimodal, maybe some people can't use certain modes. What are the challenges there for mobility? Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a few, um, but in terms of, not, never mind just the, the parking side and there's a sort of lack within the city centre, there's also so the move towards city centres becoming more bike and pedestrian friendly. You know, there's still going to be a need for some cars to enter into this space. So you've got, for example, you need accessible parking bays because if you've got, say, a two mile radius of pedestrianised area, you can't put someone with limited mobility at the, mid, at the edge of that radius and ask them to make their own way there. Like, for example, there needs to be sort of freedom between taxis and buses um, and with the likes of the ride shares and the autonomous vehicles, you know, you, they, they would need to be wheelchair accessible in some ways as well. You've got, you know, by default, yeah, taxis in the UK are fully accessible, but there's only a small percentage within Ireland that are. So, like, it'd be interesting just to see how autonomous vehicles and ride shares kind of become more ubiquitous just how accessibility is taken into that um, example too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, it, it, and further to Ivana's definition, it nearly needs to be this all-inclusive uh, solution that's not, not any particular mode, but also looks at all the different people and all their different needs, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, maybe we're not where we thought we'd be uh, in terms of smart mobility at this stage. You know, you had predictions of, 2000 being the year to have flying cars 50 years before um, and we're, we're certainly not there yet but maybe either of you could tell us a little bit more about what trends you're seeing now in terms of maybe those particular modes or mobility in smart cities generally that are kind of shaping the way we're going to go forward maybe Vanny you were talking about AI and the introduction maybe is that something that's going to change the face of mobility or um it will contribute to it, yes, because we'll, you know, we have AIs heavily in, in um, autonomous vehicles. They rely on navigating through, through cities in autonomous vehicles. Uh, ride sharing apps are uh, using AI to, to match demand supply. Uh, traffic lights, uh, we could control them by using more intelligent um, algorithms based on, based on real time information. But uh, the the trends the trends are on using on <laughs> utilizing the data that we have and gathering more data from all these additional sensors that we all have now in our mobile phones or deploying any any additional sensors that that we might need to gather the data in order to inform inform mobility. So uh, that's an overall trend, and then reflected in a number of technologies so autonomous cars definitely we see we see push for for that everywhere again the data that needs to be gathered for that are the you know the layouts of the cities the, the travel patterns the the road layouts that the vehicles will, will have to navigate uh we definitely see the increase towards sharing uh car sharing and ride sharing so whether you know, I'm a single occupant at a time, but that vehicle is shared with someone else or ride sharing in terms of the way Uber does it and the way, way my taxi my taxi does it. Um, I don't actually know the figures for Ireland, but there is trend in good few European countries of decreasing number of people getting driver's licenses. So young people in your generations are more interested in, you know, 
multitasking and being driven around than driving themselves. And yeah. that is, I see that as a positive trend uh, towards reducing number of vehicles. Uh, mobility as a service is one of emerging trends where you um, treat trip from A to B as a sequence of whatever modes you need to use to get from A to B, but you're not, you're, you're paying, so, so similar to the type of, you know, paying for your mobile plan, you include your mobility plan includes that many taxi minutes, that many bus minutes, or a limit to travel or this or that, and you mix and match as you need, rather than you having a, you know, a yearly bus ticket, and that is your only mode of, of movement around. So those are some, some general trends that we're observing. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, certainly in, in Dunleary and, and Dublin, we're seeing a lot more cycle infrastructure being being deployed all along the coast. There's a new massive new two-way cycle lane, which is really, really impressive. But Matt, maybe that's, you know, an issue in itself, as you said, that that's not usable for everybody. So maybe we could talk a little bit about who's benefiting from the technology and who's being left behind, both in terms of the people and the actual technology that's behind it. Um, so what, what would you say to that? Yeah, so I mean, sort of uh, the, to Ivana's point that, you know, currently AI and the machine learning piece is being trained on the data sets that we have currently. And in a lot of cases, those data sets may be biased, whether intention unintentionally, to certain aspects. Um, so for example, say uh, ride sharing apps or with Uber, I know from my experience, trying to order an accessible Uber because there are so few of them because there's a there's a degree that people with accessibility needs don't use car sharing apps or don't use ride sharing apps because but then it's sort of a catch-22. Um, people aren't using them because they aren't accessible and therefore the data says that people aren't using them so they're not going to become accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise with, with city centers becoming more bike friendly, you know, there's a danger that as that means footpaths could potentially get encroached upon. So there, and there's a huge section of the um, community that you know, needs wider footpaths, people with uh, mobility needs in particular. Um, and Ivana, you mentioned things like the traffic lights and the AI piece, uh, just to make sure that you know, there's a balanced data set being set so that people with maybe visual impairments take longer to cross than others. So it's about, you know, making sure that the data being used is, is encompassing everybody, not just what's the easiest data set to find. And yeah, if I could, if, yeah. yeah, if I could add in, uh, add to that as well. That's exactly as much for saying. If we, so we have a lot of data, but we are also missing a lot of data. Uh, there is uh, the thing that's gaining a increased awareness is gender data gap on how we lack a lot of data about different needs of women in different sectors. So women in healthcare and so on. In this, in this context women in transport, for example, we know that uh, women in general, okay, swooping generalization, but those are the averages that various survey found, surveys found, that women generally move, their journeys are a lot different and a lot more complex than journeys of men. And Yuan has found that um, transport, both provision and planning has male bias. And we're moving towards gathering some data. I know Transport Infrastructure Ireland is doing currently or have just finished a survey of women's travel needs. And that needs to be done for everyone, for all the groups that we need to provide the services for. Because as Matt says, our current patterns of movement are how we fit into technologies and needs that are currently available. That is not necessarily how we'd like to move around. We just do the best with what we have. And first of all, we need to take a baseline to get to data about current moves, but also we need to, this is a trickier part, you know, because it, it's, you know, it requires us all to think about this hypothetical future, but we need to have surveys of how would people like to move in the ideal world uh, and how much, you know, in order to plan for changing the infrastructures based on needs and preferences, not just trying to fit into what's there and having more of the same. Mm. Yeah, I think in the, in the talk before we came on, you, you'd mentioned that cities are designed for 20 year old white men in their mid twenties uh, who are right-handed. So <laughs> certainly something that, that could be worked on. Um, but 
I think you also touched on there, maybe you could talk about a little bit more on this AI bias. Um, at, so you said that we have some data, but we need to get more. What, what are we missing there? What, what needs to be added in or how do we get more data? Um, well, some of it is from technological perspective. Some of it is capturing how we move now. Some of it is uh, working on detecting that bias in existing data sets so that AI doesn't exaggerate it, which requires, uh, there's a big push in the, the concept of AI explainability because a lot of AI algorithms currently so-called black boxes as in they make decisions that we don't know why did they come up with such decisions. We need to have explainable AI that we could trace exactly what was it that caused that caused that that decision. So it's not as simple as, for example, in terms of gender bias or race bias. Uh, you don't have to be a check have to have a checkbox which says gender or race. The algorithm can make wrong inferences and assumptions based on other characteristics that if we don't have insight into where did it go wrong, we, we can't fix it. Mm. So it's, it's um, explainability and um, just making sure our data sets are as, um, as I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard. As biased, as, as not biased as possible. Yeah. But even you know, even uh, even in the news yesterday or the day before, there was a researcher from UCT that discovered massive boat race and sexist bias in a big MIT data set that they had to pull down uh, because it was. And you know, it's MIT data set. Mm. Universities all over the world and students and researchers all over the world was using that and training their algorithms on that. And it turns out there was some crazy amount is it 80,000 or even 8 million or something I'm making up numbers here but uh, it's a huge data set that contains both racist and sexist labels on images that were then propagated later so uh, it's it's looking out for things like that and, and making sure we don't yeah. have the future where algorithms are trained on that <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and I think you know Generally, and you know, the MIT example is good, but can we bring this back now to Dublin? How accessible is the city? Is, are these issues prevalent at our local level in Dublin and Dunleary, or is this a global problem that needs to be tackled on a global scale? Is there something that we can do at home maybe to, to help this? Maybe Matt on our report, is, is there something there that can be done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that as a whole, you know, Dublin has become a lot, a lot more accessible than what it was. Because uh, I know, sort of growing up, sort of in late nineties, early two thousands, I found that, you know, me using a rollator to get around, I found that the buses weren't accessible. And now, you know, thankfully we've got the the fleet that's fully accessible. And when the Lewis came in, it was very much a a, a co design aspect with the, with the Irish Literary Association to make sure all the Lewis stops were fully accessible too. So I think that was a good example of how, okay, there's there's work to be done, but you know, there's progression in terms of we're designing this in, in the right way. But at the same time, while the Lewis was designed from an accessible perspective, there's also this sort of education piece that needs to be done to the general general populace as well and sort of how to um, you know handle say for example on crowded Lewis stops how people with reduced mobility should be given priority to get onto them. And usually this is done quite well at bus stops, but it should be done across the um, the, the, the tran transport infrastructure. And I think that you know things like the report that we've done helps to highlight currently that there'd be a case of but we don't know how accessible we are until we know how not accessible we are if that makes sense so it's like getting this starting point to be able to make improvements from um has been the most important thing and that's sort of yeah yeah Dublin has made great strides in that respect. Hmm. Ivana what do you think how accessible is Dublin for you? Uh well, I'm, I'm fortunate that I do not rely on accessible features to, to get around, but just from the, you know, from the experience of trying to, you know, push a buggy through through the city of Dublin, uh, we can do with a lot of awareness. You know, people park on the pad going, I'll just nip into the shop for a few minutes. Uh, that completely prevents someone from going about their day for, you know, a few a few minutes until you're not into the shop, not deep into the shop to get you Lucas later or whatever. So it's uh, there. 
there needs to be a lot more a lot more awareness okay so it's it's not just these technical solutions there needs to be kind of passenger education nearly uh to, to try and get people on board is that it essentially yeah yeah i think that's that's i mean the technology can only take you so far unless people embrace the meaning behind it not just what it does if that makes sense brilliant yeah i think ivana probably this is one of the questions that uh, a lot of people get excited by when you talk about autonomous cars but uh with the development of autonomous cars, how will infrastructure change? Um, will there be new business models? Um, what else do we need to change to kind of accommodate what, what clearly is the future of automobiles? Yes, and that, that ties in also with, I think, with one of the questions we got prior to the seminar about parking. And I see we also have a question at the moment uh, on Q&A about... Uh, how will reduction in cars free up the space for other things in cities? And so all of that. Sorry, Ivan, just before you start, I might just read out the question we got in. Yes, please do. Uh, so this question relates to the future of car parking and how it is changing in other countries. What impact do you think new parking technologies and car services will have on changing the built environment in Ireland? And how much scope is there to reduce parking space or change the way parking spaces provided in denser locations with good public transport. How do you get to that question? Sorry, Ivana, back to you. Yeah, so uh, at, at, the start of the, at the start of this, you said, you know, we had predictions how we will have autonomous cars by, by 2020. Uh, as much as I'd like to drive around in one, um, I am glad they're not here yet and not from a technological point of view. I'm, you know, I'm happy to, to trust them once they're here, but I think the rest of cities, that the way cities are still organized, the business models are, if we had autonomous cars tomorrow, we wouldn't be able to utilize it to the best that we could use it to reshape how our cities are. We would just replace current private vehicles mm -hmm. with autonomous vehicles and we'd get nowhere. So this is, this delay in technology gives us time to rethink how do we want our cities to look like. Yes, if the cars are autonomous, they could drop us off to work and go and park themselves outside the city as opposed to park in the office block parking lot. But that would just create a lot of extra traffic and be even less sustainable because we'll have a lot of empty vehicle, vehicle uh, miles with vehicles going back and forth, parking themselves and then coming back to pick us up. Mm much better model for that is car sharing where we're utilizing these vehicles throughout the day for other purposes uh, so that we're looking for cars to be utilized close to 24 7 rather than an hour a day an hour of day as, as they are now and then we could use it we could reduce the vehicles vehicle numbers and reduce the um congestion and all the negative both environmental and lifestyle uh, consequences that come with it but also free up the parts of the city for other things, you know, for, for bikes, for parks, for recreational activities. So we have a chance to, to, to redesign cities now. And as I said, I'm glad technology is given us time to delay and technology is given us time to do it now. Now it's up to us whether we actually grab that chance and do it or we just end up with the same place where we are now with you know with traffic jams in 15 years but it's just autonomous cars standing in one spot as opposed to human driven ones is there a best in class example that you could give us of a city that is doing this already or is it just all cities need to work towards this i think all cities need to work on it it's you know yeah. given that uh, i don't know what's happening behind the scenes um i think uh, hope there are colleagues in smart dublin uh I, you know, I know there are a number of, of city networks, uh, both European and worldwide, that they would have insights into what's happening in other cities and exchanging best practices and so on. So, uh, you know, nothing is on the ground yet because we, we're not in a position to do it yet. But I'm confident that those conversations and plans are happening, happening behind the scenes. Yeah, definitely. Um, Matt, are there other business models that could be for this? underserved kind of accessible audience or is that something that that is being talked about um i think it's yeah it's sort of a wider thing to kind of get the idea that you know the um 
people with accessible needs also you know have a need to to spend money and go out and you know enjoy the, the built environment as everybody else and you know there's been a few sort of on the accessible tourism side as well like there's been examples in in germany where um people with these needs are are likely to spend up to like 1.8 times more in businesses if they know that it's accessible and you know that's something that really needs to be brought to the fore of businesses that it's not you're you're not making it accessible because you have to you're making it accessible because you know it, it actually helps your business in the long run and i think that one of the things that the advent of all this the, the social distancing measures being brought into businesses actually has the byproduct of both making businesses accessible uh, because you're widening aisles and such things like that but you're also making it not so accessible on the outside so you've got que maybe queuing outside and maybe lessens the, the, the width on footpaths for people who need it. So I think that there definitely is um, a need for businesses to realize that, you know, good accessibility is, is good for your business in the end too. Mm. Brilliant, so, so just bringing together those two points, uh, firstly, the, the technology piece that's gonna sh change how the city is designed, but then the accessibility piece together, what do we need to know in order to plan and better design our cities to accommodate those two things. Certainly, obviously, Dublin is kind of an older Georgian town. It's, we don't have massive roads to, to make room for things. So what do we need to know to make those decisions to maximize what, what we do have in Dublin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> A lot. <laughs> <laughs> you left us both speechless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Where do we like, start? <laughs> um, I think one of the ways you start is like you you look at sort of how how the entire city wants to move. So I think essentially, if you look at it from a from a city perspective, Dublin is essentially a series of small villages sort of knitted together at its core. So you look at those smaller areas too, to how to make the, the smaller communities and sort of more accessible and then branch out from there, rather than looking to, you know, how do you need an elephant one bite at a time kind of thing. You know, you focus on, this is why I think the Smart Sandy for an example is great because you're looking at testing out these technologies and testing out different um, ways of doing things on a smaller scale and then being able to widen it out to, to a larger city because you know, as they, just by telling us how do you make Dublin accessible, it's quite daunting to begin with, but it's sort of like taking it on smaller projects at a time, I think is a, is a, is a good way of going about it. You're saying the right things there, Matt. Exactly. Smart science is the way to go. <laughs> oh, that's what you were fishing for, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Should have queued us in before. <laughs> um, Okay, maybe Ivana, we can talk about the, the data management piece. So you've said we, we have all of these, these data sets, we need more data. How, how are we supposed to manage this? You know, if, if maybe in Dublin we have four different local authorities, they're all going about their, their business. Is there a way to centralize or standardize this data or, or what do we need to do there that's, that's missing today? Um, well, from the perspective of, of computer science, uh, we are all advocating decentralization processing at the place where it's generated reacting in real time and, and so on so to talk about example of traffic lights we are hoping to get to the stage where each traffic light is processing its own conditions observing things talking to neighboring traffic lights rather than all of it going back to the centralized location because there's a delay in sending data then in the central point, you have huge amounts that need to be processed and they are sending things back by the time the local conditions have changed and so on. So the whole with the internet of things and uh, decentralization of and lots of sensors being available at, at, we call it the edge of the network, we are hoping that more of that processing will happen in real time on the edges of the network on the ground. So kind of from a technological perspective, we don't want data to be centralized. From planning perspective, of you know someone having an insight into what's happening in the city for long-term planning that absolutely all needs to be gathered gathered in, in one place so uh, you know not necessarily, not necessarily physically get it in one place but when we are planning the city we need to look into traffic patterns on uh, travel patterns on uh, lewis on dublin bus and on, on bikes on walking on uh, 
locations of, of various schools, institutions, and so on, which city planners are doing doing at the moment. But the data that's currently missing also needs to be needs to be filled in. And, and as I was saying, there is a lot of that happening. Um, the, the the examples, you know, some of the data comes from uh, CSO figures. I know UCD a few years ago did a big uh, travel travel survey on again, but again reflecting how are people currently moving. Transport yeah. Infrastructure Ireland is doing a survey on uh, women's travel needs. We need to first of all identify what are the data gaps find a way to fill them in, find a way to merge them with existing data that don't necessarily have to be in the same format, but they have to be correlated and analyzed at the same time. You know, if we have a peak on Dublin bus at one point, if we don't correlate that with there being a breakage on dart line, we won't be able to explain why is that, that peak there. So mm -hmm. the data needs to be analyzed need to be we need to look for correlations between them and causality rather than not planning each each separately absolutely and i think you know smart dublin has the dub linked platform where a lot of this public data sets are available but you do need that analysis piece where you are putting two and two together to, to figure out where where the correlation is and maybe matt how have you find it as kind of in terms of developing access earth and and getting that up and running. How has it been for you managing this large amount of data you've got coming in from, from different users? Um, I think it, it, it was a challenge when we first sort of started out. We didn't sort of, um, I think, obviously the advent of the cloud when we first started really had really helped things and how we're going to be processing a lot of this. But then also with AI and machine learning sort of coming into the fore as we were developing has really helped to inform how we sort of plan to scale this. Um, but also, as you said, getting access to like existing data sets and using that to help inform decisions on how, you know, how users are sort of interacting with the built environment has been really, um, really helpful to be honest, because, you know, there, there's a danger that when, when you're designing and doing things like building a product that you do this in sort of a a, a black box where there's no real input from the outside world. And I think the, the co-design or the engaged research aspect has been really key to how sort of we've been we've been sort of developing access earth. And I think it's something that you know a lot of companies really should be taking into account and you know doing these test pilots within smaller communities and things like that. So yeah. Yeah. And it's probably just as you've mentioned the co-design Matt, I was going to mention at the end, but we might mention local companies who want to engage with either enable or access earth on these kind of projects you can do it through smart sanity fridge if you want to email myself or get in touch with either of the guys and you know it's, it's a great opportunity to get access to, to new data share your own projects or, or start new projects with researchers or or private companies and i, I think you know it's, it's a great opportunity to get in touch with with ivana or matt on that um so maybe I think an important question that always comes up on, on you know, any talk of transport or mobility is the green issue and, and the impact it's having on climate. Um, you know, are these new technological developments going to help or, or hinder the, the green movement, do you think? You know, these massive data sets, are they going to eat up carbon or the overall reduction in cars? Is that going to be, is that going to outweigh that impact or what do you think? Well, that is the that is that it again comes down to how do we use technology itself. Um, the because the large amounts of data that we're looking to to process to make the design decisions that's a kind of you know one saw. We're not going to be redesigning city every few minutes. So the large kind of processing of data won't be you know won't be damaging the environment too much. Any real-time processing where we're hoping to do on traffic lights in individual vehicles and so on, definitely processing relatively small amounts of data because it has to happen quickly. Mm. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, you know, knowing more won't damage environment more, but it is about, you know, what do we do with, with those technologies? And it's, 
you know, there are speculation that autonomous vehicles will only increase vehicle usership and car ownership and car usage because it will be so convenient. You won't have to drive. You'll be able to multitask. You know, now you hop on a train because you want to work on a train down to work to prepare for the meeting. If the car can do that, drive by itself while you work, will a lot of people switch to switch to cars? So that is a lot to to awareness and provision of alternative alternative services and public transport multimodal multimodal and, and uh, approaches to, to transport and so on because it's um, you know technology is technology it's what it is it's how we use it that can either help or damage environment environment further. Mm. Yeah, so kind of the policies and incentives around the technology are, are almost as important. Um, policies, incentives, and most importantly, provision of, of alternative modes. So connected, multimodal, public transport, uh, bike lanes, uh, places that are pleasant and safe to walk, that are accessible, uh, shared modes again which are accessible again currently you can hop in a shared vehicle only if you don't have a wheelchair or if you don't have a ch child you know <laughs> so you can't you can't use either if you need a you know if you need a wheelchair space if you need a child car seat there's you know the there needs to be matching there need to be alternatives provided to people to switch from cars uh if we're going to, whether they're, you know, regardless of whether they're manual driven or, or autonomous. Mm, absolutely. Matt, would you have uh, anything to comment to add? No, I think, Ivana, you pretty much covered everything perfectly there. You nailed it, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so just to, I'm conscious of time, so finish up maybe on, on a positive note. Obviously, Dublin is a capital city, it does have its issues. But what, what are we doing well that, you know, we can build on now going forward with these new technologies? Do you want to um, start, Analia? Yeah, <laughs> sure. I think it's been very much of, like, it's, it's been very open to, like, trying new things, trying to, new technologies. And, and I think it's all coming from the right place as well. It's not just a case of, you know, trying to be the most te technologically advanced city in the world to get it wants to it's it's about how how do you make the community more connected and i think that that's something dublin is doing um quite well even you know the likes of say smart sandy for there'd be a few few cities in the world that wouldn't have these clear test beds for people to start interacting with the community and i think dublin is quite good at being open with ways to collaborate with businesses and things like that which you know the other larger cities um might not be yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of it, it's a good place or a testbed or ground to try out new technologies. There's a lot of, uh, we see a lot of different bike sharing schemes, car sharing schemes, um, involving citizens into designs or, and businesses through various stakeholder workshops that I know Smart Smart Dublin are, are doing. Um, we do a lot of um, we do a lot of good research in the area, which of course we're starting again to involve uh, citizens. So before I know, I said I do a lot of ride sharing ride sharing work. As much as I like to do it for the sake of it, because it's fun, and I like to you know I like the algorithms that work and are cool. Uh, the question was, will anyone use this? So to preface that work, we've surveyed fifteen hundred uh, people living in Dublin, asking. Would you use autonomous cars? What are your concerns about using one? Would you share it with someone? Uh, what kind of modes would you, what kind of arrangements would you like to share it in? Would you prefer to own it? Public transport, current taxi services, and so on. So to see, we can only predict or even try to predict through simulation uh, what are the, what the impact will that have if we know how many people will, will use it. So, uh, I think we have a very strong ecosystem, both in very, uh, you know, agile and quick reacting local councils and Smart Dublin and so on. We have a very active research community. Uh, 
a lot of startups in the mobility area. So hopefully it's the right mix to, to get Dublin where we want it to be in, in 15, 20 years, where we have these shared autonomous cars driving around with a lot of, you know, but, you know, all the current, current um, three or four lane roads are just two or city centers fully pedestrianized and we have more parks, happy people cycling everywhere, you know. <laughs> Imagine your dream Dublin and you know figure out um figure out how can we how can we get there. We got a slight preview of it, you know, through very unfortunate circumstances, but we got a really nice preview of, of how car free city center can look like recently with, with COVID situation. Um so we'd like to keep some of that if possible. <laughs> And uh, certainly, if we could keep that weather too, that'll be that'll be really helpful. <laughs> um, I, I think that's just about all we have time for. Just to to summarize, I think Ivana, you hit on a really good point when you were giving the definition at the very start, and it was smart mobility is all about matching supply with demand. And I think a large part of that certainly came up all through the different points was educating people, not just the technology piece, but educating and it being more inclusive in, in how we're applying that technology. Um, for, for certainly a number of the different groups we talked about. Um, I think standardized infrastructure, be it, you know, certainly in the example map you gave of the spaces at, at a very low level are, are so different in, a, in an area like Sandyford that we could standardize those, but on a greater scale, maybe things like the Lewis, the bus, and, and, and taxis could all have similar uh, setups for, for logging in an application or that kind of thing. And I think the, the data, data issue is, is one that's certainly going to be huge over the next couple of years. And it's coming up all through a number of the different topics on, on the webinar series. Um, so th thank you both very much for, for, for coming on. It's, it's been a really good, uh, really good discussion. Um, I'd like to just thank Smart Dublin, uh, Enable, uh, Trinity College Dublin, uh, the Sinyford Bid and the Murat Down County Council, our partners. These webinars take place monthly, so please join our next webinar on the 11th of August, where we'll be discussing IoT and its impact for business. And as I mentioned earlier, if, if you'd like to get involved with ourselves and Smart Sandyford, Enable in Trinity College Dublin, or with Access Earth, please do get in touch with myself, Ivana, or Matt, and we'd be delighted to, to work with you. Thank you very much, uh, and I'll say goodbye there. Bye. Thank you.